So, um, welcome back. So this is part two of our uh, neuropathology review. Um, it's uh, it's it really kind of trying to keep it tight to about two hours, and um, so we've got uh, we've got the remainder of uh, our tumors to cover, and then we'll we'll kind of go through a few sort of highlights of uh, non neoplastic neuropathology. Try to get you guys some spotters and take a few guesses as to what you might be asked about um, out of the vast realm of non neoplastic neuropathology. But in any event, so where we, where we stopped off last time was right at meningiomas. Um, and uh, so what, what is a meningioma? This is a dural-based neoplasm that arises from the arachnoid cap cells of the leptomeninges. And so the, um, the, this is, the meningiomas are actually a great example of histogenesis. So... You know, back, back before we were defining things, at least partly by molecular diagnostics, um, we, we, of course, looked at, at tumors and, and tried to figure out what their cell of origin was, that what their putative cell of origin was. And uh, in many cases, that's, that's not very easy. This tumors look quite different than what you see in the, the other cells in the body. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's, uh, it's very straightforward. Uh, arachnoid cap cells or meningothelial cells look exactly like what you run into within a meningioma. So you'll see these, these little variants, little versions of these guys just kind of um, um, slotted throughout the, the, uh, the arachnoid mater. But uh, in any event, so if you see a meningioma, though, it's a mass-forming version of the same thing. So uh, remember, there's also meningothelial cells in the choroid plexus, and so you can have intraventricular meningiomas, not that infrequently. Um, these are most common in women, uh, and particularly when you're dealing with uh, meningiomas along the spine, it's much more common uh, in women, about 9 to 1 female to male ratio. So a lot of the, the sort of rules that we use in neuropathology in terms of spinal tumors, you think about if you've got a, a spinal uh, a, a, a uh, extramedullary intradural tumor in the spine in a woman, you really do think a lot about meningioma. Um, and then particularly if it's, if it's in a man, say along the posterior aspect of the spine, again, extramedullary intradural, you think a lot more about a schwannoma. Um, because for whatever reason, schwannomas um, tend, to, tend to arise off of the sensory nerves. Um, and so off the sensory nerve roots, so they'll be more, more posterior. But in any event, so uh, the meningiomas express EMA, epithelial membrane antigen. You guys remember me talking about that with, uh, with ependymomas. Uh, but these diffusely express EMA. Uh, and they're also, they'll also express progesterone receptor. Uh, and the, the, the grading scheme is a little bit complicated in general. The MIB-1, uh, the proliferation index, does relate to the grade. And, of course, you guys know these are enhancing dural-based masses with dural tails, meaning like they have little... They, they, they kind of tail off into the dura around, around the edges of the mass. Uh, and then they'll have, uh, usually have some hyperostosis in the underlying or adjacent bone. So this classification scheme uh, is a little bit different now in the post-2016 WHO. Um, so you still have grade one meningiomas. These are uh, sometimes, some people would call those benign meningiomas. Uh, we, again, don't usually use the term benign for a brain tumor. I think it's a little bit misleading um, just because grade 1 meningiomas can clearly recur. And if they're uh, big enough and in a, a location that you can't get them out or um, they continue to recur, they can, they can certainly uh, cause a lot of problems for patients. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to call something like that benign. In any event, uh, atypical meningiomas are, are WHO grade 2. And we define atypical by a number of different things. First thing is, easiest way to define atypical meningioma is look for increased mitotic figures. Um, also, you look for uh, cordoid or clear cell histology. So the Cs are atypical. Um, or there's a, what I call the histologic grab bag uh, of, uh, of atypical histologic features. So those would be uh, prominent nucleoli, uh, sheeting archite architecture or loss of architecture, hypercellularity, small cell change, and necrosis. If you've got three of those uh, out of five of those, it's a WHO grade two uh, 
um, an angioma. Fundamentally, what that does is allow a, a pathologist or experienced neuropathologist in particular to be able to look at a meningioma and say, ah, oh, this is not a, this is a weirdo meningioma. All right, something's wrong with this. And I can go look at, count up the features and make it to grade two, regardless of whether I can find the mitotic figures or not to, to sort of seal the deal. Brain invasion counts to make a, a meningioma grade two. Invasion of soft tissue doesn't count, only the brain. Brain is king, right? So, um, in any event, you can have these things go well through the soft tissue. And we actually have a, a case this week that where there was a pretty significant invasion of the soft tissue, uh, but it's still a grade one meningioma. Um, so then grade three meningiomas are anaplastic meningiomas, and again, much higher mitotic count. Rhabdoid or papillary histology will give you some examples of those. Um, and then uh, and basically areas of the meningioma that doesn't look like a meningioma anymore, sarcomatoid or carcinomatoid areas. This is an area where be a pathologist would look at the meningioma and say, I can't even tell this is a meningioma. It's got this one little area that kind of looks like a meningioma, and the rest of it looks like a carcinoma or sarcoma, frank malignancy. So those would be anaplastic. Um, meningioma, that you guys know this better than I do. Uh, you see these things sitting in situ, but if, of course you, you'll have this little fleshy nodule um, coming off directly off or seated on the dura. Um, there's the little bits of dura left over on this specimen. Um, what do we see under the microscope? We see a syncytial proliferation, classically syncytial proliferation. What does that mean? Basically means there's a mat of cytoplasm with nuclei scattered on top. Um, and uh, the nuclei do a number of different things. One thing is, is that they make quarrels, all right? you get, got to pronounce the H, whorl. Um, and uh, so they'll start to spin around. Um, and they'll also, they produce, meningiomas produce a lot of collagen. Most brain tumors make, don't make a lot of collagen. Meningiomas do. Um, and so when these, and this collagen gets laid down along the whorls sometimes and, uh, and spins around and then eventually will calcify and form a somoma body, all right? Um, but the, the individual nuclei have a characteristic appearance to them. They're kind of round oval, little speckled chromatin, and a small nucleolus. So talk about somoma bodies. Here's a great example of a somomatous meningioma, where you just get tons and tons and tons of somoma bodies. These are grade one by uh, almost all the time. Uh, and you see them a lot along the spine. Atypical meningiomas. Uh, will so show more hypercellularity, more cellularity, and then the nuclei look a little bit weirder, okay? There's, there's a little bit more atypia, and in particular, more prominent nuclei. These nuclei, nu nuclei are staring back at us here. Um, and, of course, we'll start to see uh, more mitotic activity. That's what e most easily helps you to find WHO grade 2 meningioma. Um, or you see brain invasion, and this is the way that meningiomas invade the brain. So you remember we were talking a lot about infiltration last week, um, and that and when you're talking about brain tumors or infiltrating gliomas, um, the, when you talk about infiltration, you're basically meaning single cell infiltration, like the individual cells can work their way through the brain, the brain parenchyma. The meningiomas are not uh, are not native to, at least to the brain parenchyma itself, so they can't do that. Um, they they invade the brain as tongues. So here you see. Uh, brain in the top left-hand corner of the screen, meningioma in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, and this thing is reaching out to touch somebody. It's, going, it's, it's basically w winnowing its way into the brain tissue. So that's de grade two by definition, at least. Uh, another uh, version of a grade two meningioma would be a cordoid meningioma, and by cordoid it means it looks kind of like a chordoma. All right, so it's got this bluish mixoid background, um, and then the, the cells m run together in cords, and you have to kind of hunt around to find areas that maybe have some whorls, some leftover things that allow you to be pretty sure it's a meningioma. Um, of course, also it would help if this isn't uh, you know, arising off the clivus or something like that. But uh, uh, this would be grade two by definition. Um, anaplastic meningioma, uh, this, is, uh, this is, in this scenario, the the tumor cells start to look even worse, start to look a little less, look a little bit less like a meningioma, and the mitotic count becomes pretty striking. So, you know, just in this field, we got one, two, three, four, five, six mitotic figures. So, you know, we'll we would have nine more to count just to get to twenty, um, and then this in the middle would be an atypical mitotic figure. That's not a spindle that one should have seen set up. All right. <clears throat> 
uh, papillary meningiomas, or WHO grade 3 also by definition, and papillary basically just means that the tumor cells are kind of are, are stuck around a, a central vessel, um, and there may be a fair amount of necrosis along the, the periphery of that. So looks, you know, papillary, when you t use the term papillary in pathology, you're basically referencing something that might look like a cauliflower or a broccoli, um, and this would be like a cauliflower or a broccoli cut in section and then having necrosis around it. So what do we, uh, we know a lot about meningioma genetics now, um, and uh, uh, this is it's actually, it, meningiomas were studied pretty extensively cytogenetically up to you know, 20, 10, 20, 30 years ago, because you, um, you can get them to grow in culture pretty well and actually study, um, study the chromosomes. But uh, uh, in any event, we can, we've been able to figure out that the, the progression mechanism of meningiomas can be, can be demonstrated by looking at the chromosomes. Most meningiomas that are grade one have basically shown no chromosomal abnormalities or maybe a loss on chromosome 22. That's where NF2 is. Uh, and then the higher grade meningiomas usually show more uh, cytogenetic changes. And the classic ones are loss of 1P, uh, 6Q, 10, uh, 14Q, and 18Q. Um, and basically, the more abnormalities you get, the more likely it is going to be a, a higher grade meningioma. So another thing that comes off of the dura the dural base mass, is uh, uh, what's classically called in neuropathology a hemangiopericytoma, uh, or the other term that we would use these days is solitary fibrous tumor. The reason why do we swap that up? Basically, solitary fibrous tumors are a tumor type that's defined in the rest of the body by the soft tissue pathologists. So they've been seeing these things along the pleural surface and along the peritoneal surface and elsewhere in the body for, for years, and we saw we had our version in the brain called, and we called it hemangioparasitoma because we're just different, right? And so, uh, but the, the over uh, over the last few years, it's been pretty convincingly demonstrated uh, that basically the tumors are the same, and they're all defined by this uh, STAT6 NAB2 translocation. So fundamentally, it's a translocation tumor. Uh, this is there's a whole category of tumors seen throughout the body. Uh, that are basically defined by various different translocations. Synovial sarcoma would be one, um, but, but uh, Ewing sarcoma, same sort of thing. So a solitary fibrous tumor is a translocation-associated tumor um, that's characterized more by the translocation than it is by any lo uh, particular location. Um, so, so SFT, or hemangiopericytoma, um, is uh, they express C CD34, which is a, a, a vascular marker. It's part of the reason that it got the name hemangiopericytoma. Uh, less so, it'll show some EMA. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about the grading schemes, there's a lot of grading schemes for the, uh, SFTs in the rest of the body that basically reference metastatic risk to the brain. All right? <laughs> so if you're already there, uh, you, you kind of need a different grading approach. But uh, looking at, this, at these tumors, you see, a, again, lots of collagen, so it doesn't help you. The, the, the main differential is with a meningioma most of the time. Uh, it, but it does show these characteristic vessels that, look, that are called staghorn. So if you think about this being a deer head, all right, this would be his antlers coming off. And sometimes you get, you get a very nice sort of uh, um, staghorn appearance. Uh, to the vest, to the vasculature, but otherwise you'll see lots of collagen and these uh, and these tumor cells scattered around that look a, a little bit more spindled than a typical uh, uh, meningioma nucleus. But uh, uh, the other thing that we describe in, in pathology is is great term. It's called the patternless pattern. <laughs> that uh, that uh, that we that we've it's it does have a repeated a repeated appearance. It's basically these little spindle cells laying down in in um, sort of a crosshatch um, appearance, but um, for some reason people call it the patternless pattern. So melanocytoma is another dural based tumor. Uh, these are melanocytic neoplasms. So remember, you've got melan uh, normal melanocytes in the leptomeninges. Um, and there's more of them in African American individuals than, or people with pigmented skin than people with less pigmented skin. Uh, you can actually look at someone's brain. Uh, when we do brain cutting sometimes, we can sort of speculate as to what the, uh, the, pig the skin pigmentation status of the individual was based upon the, 
the degree of, of uh, pigmentation along the brain stem in particular. But in any event, these are, so melanocytomas are more common in areas frequently, uh, frequented by the melanocytes along the base of the brain, brain stem. Um, and you, these could be benign melanocytomas. There's a melanocytic lesion of intermediate differentiation, and then there's a pr primary CNS melanoma. Um, these express melanocytic markers, S100 protein, melan A, HMB45, tyrosinase. Those, those three, eight, melan A, HMB45, and tyrosinase, are basically related to uh, melanin production. Uh, and then MITF is a translocation or is a um, transcription factor. Uh, related to melanocytic der uh, derivation. And then uh, the imaging would show, be very similar to an angioma, but there may, it may be T1 bright uh, secondary to tumoral melanin. So what do these things look like? The, you can see it looks a little bit sensational. The, again, these can be difficult to distinguish from an angioma. What you're going to look for is deposition of pigment, melanin pigment. Um, many of these will have some melanin pigment. And the nuclei... Uh, usually have much uh, pretty prominent nucleoli, and they're 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 oftentimes quite oval. Um, and but you have to have the kind of the thought. The thought has to come to your head, and then you do the stains, and you define it as a melanocytoma. Hemangioblastoma. So a, a, the critical thing to remember about hemangioblastomas: it's most second most common cerebellar tumor in adults. And to me, it's the, the experience is that it's always the forgotten the forgotten tumor for a lot of people. Uh, who who deal with some CNS pathology, whereas, you know, the, in, in what I'll often do is I'll ask people, you know, okay, so it's a cerebellar tumor, what's your differential diagnosis? First thing's always metastasis. And then the second thing, though, is actually hemangioblastoma in an adult. Um, and oftentimes folks will think of a pilocytic astrocytoma, they'll think about epidermoid cysts, this sort of thing. Remember hemangioblastoma. Um, this is a neoplasm of indeterminate cellular origin. So I went through all that ch chatting earlier about meningiomas having that defined uh, histogenesis. These have no defined histogenesis, and nobody can figure out where the heck they're actually coming from. Um, but they're defined by these foamy cells, these lipid-filled cells that uh, basically all believe that they are hypoxic. Uh, they have a VHL mutation or an abnormal VHL protein that the normal VHL protein degrades HIP1-alpha, the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. Um, and so basically these guys, these lipid cell, lipid filled cells can't degrade HIP1 alpha. So they've got lots and lots of HIP1 alpha floating around and they believe that they're terribly hypoxic. So they are, they are basically consistently asking for vessels to come feed them and solve their hypoxia. So what that does basically is just cause lots of vessels to be everywhere in these tumors. Um, and they still can't do anything about their HIP1 alpha. But, uh, uh, the imaging would show a classically assist with an enhancing mural nodule. Um, and, and the histology looks like this. So here's your foamy cells, these guys with this bubbly cytoplasm, um, and then this, all this very rich capillary vascular network uh, is what you would see in the background. So if you can kind of add those two together, you're doing pretty well with a, uh, in, a, in a cerebellar mass to think of hemangioblastoma. Choroid plexus neoplasm. So these, of course, would be somewhere near the choroid plexus. Uh, or arising from the choroid plexus. Uh, these are intraventricular, periventricular neoplasms. Lower grade neoplasms are you, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's sort of a flip side of what you see with just about every other tumor type. All right, so carcinomas are almost never tumors of children, right? Kids don't get carcinomas. Um, they get blastomas and things like that. But uh, usually, uh, in, 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 but in the choroid plexus tumors, the lower grade neoplasms, the papillomas, are usually tumors of, tumors of older people, particularly in the fourth ventricle, whereas choroid plexus carcinomas are, are classically tumors of, of kids and oftentimes in the lateral ventricles, supertentorial brain. So uh, these express markers that are sort of intermediate between glial and epithelial cells, so they'll be GFAP somewhat positive, maybe S100 positive, but then show cytokeratins, the intermediate filaments of, uh, ep of epithelial cells, and also EMA. These are enhancing masses arising from within a ventricle, uh, and they may have some intertumoral calcification. All right, so what do we look at under the microscope? We see, looks very papillary, right? Again, so like, think of a cauliflower or broccoli cut in section. Um, so you see all these projections of fibrovascular cores, and then a pretty simple epithelial uh, uh, proliferation along the top of the cores. 
Um, the, 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 the difficult thing for papillomas is to distinguish it actually just from normal choroid plexus. Normal choroid plexus would usually not have this many epithelial cells kind of crammed together. There's a little bit more space, and so therefore there's a hobnailing appearance to the, to the epithelium. There's space in between the individual tumor cells. For a papilloma, you see a very um, a smooth border because uh, you're, you're seeing all these cells kind of heaped together. You'll also see some sort of projections of just epithelium coming off as well. Um, but then for a choroid plexus carcinoma, you would see areas, maybe some areas that look a little bit more like a papilloma, uh, this more banal area here, but then oftentimes you'll, look, you'll see parts of the tumor that look like a frank malignancy and maybe a difficult to actually tell um, that it uh, is, uh, is an epithelial tumor. You'd have to do immunostains to really help yourself out. Epidermoid and dermoid cysts. Uh, these are typically regarded as embryological rests of ectoderm. Um, so both of these will show squamous epithelium and keratinaceous debris. Um, epidermoids don't have hair or, ne or adnexal structures. Dermoids do. Um, epidermoids can occur anywhere within the CNS. The classic location is at the CP angle, but they can be anywhere. Uh, dermoid tumors, though, uh, are usually along the midline. Um, uh, diffusion weighted imaging can help you differentiate the epidermoid and dermoid cyst context from CSF. But these are cystic lesions. Um, and what do we see under the microscope? Well, here's squamous epithelium, this multi-layered uh, epithelium with the cells showing desmosomes in between. If we should see some area that where the cells were splayed apart a little bit, you would see some intracellular bridges. There's probably a little bit right, that, right here. There's kind of a zipper. Looks like a little zipper in between the cells. Um, there's a granular layer at the, at the top. And then there's all this keratinaceous debris. That's what makes all that goo um, that you guys see when you go in and start to resect these things. Um, under the microscope, it's very flaky. And of course, there's no hair and no adnexal structures in an epidermoid. So um, metastatic neoplasms, though, this is, uh, of course, something that we deal with a ton. Uh, these are epithelial or malign mesenchymal malignancies that come from outside the CNS, They're coming to the CNS from somewhere else. They arrive hematogenously. And so what do they do when they arrive hematogenously? They basically set up shop around the vessel and push the brain aside. So these also don't typically infiltrate the brain. They're not native to the brain, so they push it aside. Um, and uh, they may also get to the, the brain along nerves. Um, we see that sometimes, particularly with uh, tumors along the, of the head and neck, might climb into the CNS along, along some of the cranial nerves, potentially. Um, but in any, in any event, you basically, by, you define these things based upon what the tumor origin is. So you, you, uh, so you do a lot of immunohistochemical stains to try to help you figure out where the thing is coming from or confirm where the thing is coming from. And these are just some immunostains that we might use for, for particular subtypes of tumors. Your carcinomas classically are going to be positive for keratins. AE13 is a broad spectrum keratin. Um, lung, remember your, so your metastases, uh, uh, to the CNS or, you know, lung is your by far the most common uh, primary to metastasize to the CNS. And in, in women, you would also think about a breast carcinoma. Um, the sort of uh, 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 companion tumor in a guy, if you think about this sort of thing, would be a prostate carcinoma. Also basically, you know, very common. But, uh, but, these, but prostate carcinomas typically do not metastasize to the CNS, whereas uh, brain, bre breast tumors do. Uh, melanomas are another common uh, metastasis to the CNS. You would, they would express S100 protein, melanay, HMB45, and tyrosinase, just like our melanocytomas and, and, and primary CNS melanomas would. And then sarcomas, um, they might ask you uh, on a test that, uh, that uh, the classic immunostain for a sarcoma is bimentin. That's the intermediate filament of mesenchymal cells. The problem with it, this in practice is that everything is positive for bimentin, so we don't ever use it but uh, it might be tested. So um, metastatic carcinomas, what, uh, these are basically epithelial malignancies. Um, and so what, what, do, what do epithelial cells look like? They look like, um, they're usually more polygonal. Uh, so that means they're like, you know, uh, uh, you know, pentagons or something along those lines. 
Uh, they have a more sharp uh, cytoplasmic border than you would see in many uh, uh, other CNS tumors. Um, and then the nuclei are, are enlarged and irregular. And this, in particular, this tumor is making a lot of mucin, this bluish, these little bluish blobs within the cytoplasm. They are mucin globules. That's indicative of an adenocarcinoma. Uh, this would this is another um, metastasis to the brain. It's a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, you guys have probably taken enough tests at this point in, in medicine to know that if they show you an a, uh, a tumor with a lot of clear cytoplasm, you're supposed to answer clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Um, but uh, this is what they look like. They're sort of nested. They have this, this um, uh, investiture of vessels around the packets, and then the individual tumor cells show this, this uh, characteristic clearing. Sometimes in pathology, we call it ice cube clearing. It looks like there's little ice cubes in the, in the cytoplasm. So... Uh, one of the things you use to define a metastasis is, is a sharp border. So oftentimes these things under the microscope will show a pretty clear delineation from the surrounding brain. Brain you're in, your, in your bottom left-hand corner, uh, carcinoma in the top right-hand corner. And so you can see this, this sharp line of delineation between uh, tumor and, and the surrounding brain. If the tumor does invade the uh, adjacent brain, it may go along vessels. And that's shown here. Um, you can see that this is a, this is a metastatic MPNST to the brain. And so even though it's a Schwann cell-derived tumor, Schwann cells are kind of like the glial cells of the peripheral nervous system, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't interact with the brain in the same way an infiltrating glioma would. So this thing is invading the brain along vessels, pushing it aside, though, tonguing in in the same similar sort of fashion as we saw with that meningioma. So... All these days, we do a lot of molecular workup on a lot of the, the tumors that metastasize to the CNS. Um, as uh, particularly with lung tumors, it's so common to see as CNS metastases. Um, we look for EGFR mutations, KRAS mutations, ALK rearrangements that helps guide systemic therapy. Uh, breast carcinomas, of course, we would look for ER and PR expression or HER2 amplification. Uh, and then melanomas, uh, we may also look for a BRAF mutation to help with treatment. Primary CNS lymphoma. All right, so this is a high grade. It's a it's a uh, hematolymphoid neoplasm that, uh, by definition, arises within the CNS. And primary CNS lymphomas, again, almost always high grade, and they're within the brain parenchyma. Uh, usually intraaxial, they may be periventricular, um, oftentimes periventricular. Uh, and these are almost always high grade B cell lymphomas, but 95% of the time, high grade B cell lymphomas, um, and they're. There's uh, an interesting uh, sort of de uh, delineation between two main groups of these. So one of the groups is seen in immunocompetent individuals and does not show significant necrosis. Those are the ones that are like the light bulbs on, uh, on imaging. Uh, they don't have a central area of necrosis. So those would not be EBV related. But the patient, patients who are immunocompromised and develop uh, a primary CNS lymphoma uh, will show, oftentimes lymphoma will show necrosis, and there will be EBV positivity to that tumor, okay? So it's EBV related. Uh, so some markers that we, would, that we would utilize for primary CNS lymphomas would be the pan-lymphoid marker, the leukocyte common antigen is CD45, uh, and then B-cell markers that look for B-cell derivation would be CD20 is the big one. Of course, that's the target of rituximab. Um, PAX5 is a, a transcription factor uh, with B cell derivation. And then CD79A is another um, uh, cluster differentiation marker for B cells. T cells, CD3, CD4 and 8, CD30 would be something you would use. So what do these things look like? They, they, they're uh, classically under the microscope perivascular proliferations of tumor cells. So there's your vessel there in the center. And then these tumor cells are... They stand out. They're really big and weird looking, right? They'll oftentimes recruit lots of, uh, lots of smaller friends to come along with them. Uh, all these little small banal T cells, likely small uh, T cells here. Um, but the, 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 the neoplastic cells are these guys here. And they do show some single cell infiltration of the brain parenchyma. So, you know, this would be one, the uh, lymphoma would be another one of the tumor types that's much less common, but it can show some infiltration of the surrounding brain. So these could say cross midline, um, at, least, at least potentially. 
Um, so these are, uh, again, perivascular, perivascular uh, uh, collections of malignant, malignant hematolymphoid cells. Um, if you see a bunch of necrosis with it, though, this pink granular stuff with nuclear debris is necrosis, uh, that, then you think, oh, this might be an immunocompromised patient. Uh, it might be EVV positive. I've actually had the scenario a couple of times of basically diagnosing a patient by, with HIV by defining an EVV positive primary CNS lymphoma. Um, and then your, uh, your, your, you know, what these things look like, it's just sheets of malignant cells. They're oftentimes very dishesive, so on a smear, the cells break apart and go singly all over the smear. It's one of the things we use to help define these things. So lower grade lymphomas are more commonly along the meninges. Uh, same sort of thing is with uh, things that spread to the CNS from outside the brain, the lymphomas that spread to the CNS from outside the brain, oftentimes would be along the meninges. But these low-grade lymphomas, and this is a, a classic example of one, or the more, more common example of one would be a marginal zone lymphoma or a malt, malt lymphoma. If you guys remember from medical school, people talk about malt lymphomas. This, we, the term that a pathologist would use would be a marginal zone lymphoma. And these are low-grade lymphomas that, again, are, uh, are more seen in the meninges than within the brain parenchyma itself. The high-grade ones are within the parenchyma, and the lower-grade ones are along the meninges. That's classic. Plasma cell neoplasms. So we run into plasma cell tumors a lot because we deal with spinal tumors not that infrequently. Um, and, of course, these are neoplasms of plasma cells, plasma cell derivation. They could be a single mass where they're a plasma cytoma. They could be multiple masses where they're multiple myeloma. Uh, they uh, uh, Relatively, these are often bone-based lesions, so we don't necessarily see them as, as CNS parenchymal lesions, but we'll see them in bone adjacent to the CNS. Um, and the markers that you look for with these are CD138, uh, EMA, interestingly, is epithelial membrane antigen, but also plus positive on plasma cells. Uh, CD79A is another is a B cell marker. Remember, plasma cells are terminally, quote unquote, terminally differentiated B cells, uh, even though in this case they're they're a neoplasm. Um, and then the less often you would see CD45, leukocyte common antigen. You would look for a kappa or a lambda predominance of, of light chain predominance. You could do that by immunohistochemistry. Um, and if it, it, the plasma cells are expressing CD56, that's an atypical marker that you can use, but look for immunohistochemically. So these are hematolymphoid neoplasms. So they'll, again, the, the tumor cells will look somewhat dishesive from one another, kind of separated off from one another. Um, but they're sheets. Again, just no architecture to it. Sheets of malignant appearing cells. Um, and higher power would show you that these are malignant plasma cells. They still have a fair amount of cytoplasm to them. And classically, a plasma cell will have a perinuclear hof. That's what this little, this little cape looks like here, okay? It's actually Golgi apparatus. But uh, um, these are, it has an eccentrically placed nucleus and oftentimes prominent nucleolus. The chromatin is described classically as clock face, clock face chromatin in plasma cells. So what does that mean? Okay, so this guy, he has had a little bit of clock face. So you just remember the little, the little notches around the edge of a clock. So that's where, that's where the term came from, is these little, the little blobs of chromatin along the edges of the, the uh, nuclear membrane. So Langerhans cell histiocytosis. These are, uh, these are tumors that we deal with in children. They're bone, sometimes bone-based lesions that we'd see in the skull of a kid. Um, and these are histiocytoses. This is the most common histiocytosis, and it's defined as histiocytosis by showing histiocytic markers like CD68. Um, these will also show S100 protein and CD1A. Those are what help you define it as Langerhans cell. Um, and uh, what do we see under the microscope? The classically, so these are these are histiocytoses. So lots of lots of uh, voluminous cytoplasm. Um, and, you know, macrophages, macrophage-derived things often show a lot of cytoplasm. And the nuclei have this really, um, uh, this rather characteristic appearance that's described as bean-shaped or kidney bean-shaped or kidney-shaped. And you can see this guy here. Yeah, that does kind of look like a kidney. So um, it, it, that's, if you see this appearance over and over and over again, that helps you think, hey, maybe those are Langerhans cells. And then there's a bunch of eosinophils sprinkled in with these characteristically. So very eosinophil-rich tumors. Germ cell tumors. These are seen along the midline and oftentimes in kids and young adults. 
a um, bunch of different histologic types and the markers associated with them. Uh, when you think about a, uh, something that we call a seminoma in a male testicle, a dysgerminoma in the female ovary, if it's that same exact tumor is seen in the CNS, we call it a germinoma. Um, uh, we, we define that by PLAP, uh, SAL4, OCT34, and C-KIT. Those are all positive in germinomas. In brinal carcinomas, we'd be positive for cytokeratins, CD30 and OCT34. Um, yolk sac tumors, remember AFP, alpha beta protein, is produced by yolk sac tumors. Choriocarcinomas would produce beta HCG, and they would be beta HCG positive by immunohistochemistry. And teratomas, the immunohistochemistry to corresponds to different tissue types. Remember, teratomas are basically combinations of, of, uh, of different, uh, different you know, ectoderm, endodermal structures, so forth, all mashed together. Uh, so the IHC would correspond to those different types. So germinomas look exactly like seminomas. It's just that they're in the brain. Um, and these things show these big, big nuclei with prominent nucleoli staring back at you and this somewhat feathery amphiphilic cytoplasm. All right, I'm throwing lots of pathology terms at you. Uh, this sort of stuff means, it means a lot to me because, you know, you look at this stuff enough times, you think, oh, yeah, that's feathery amphiphilic cytoplasm. But, uh, for the, but for you guys, just remember, like, this would be a midline tumor, and you'll often see lots of, uh, lots of, uh, of, of lymphocytes kind of sprinkled through the background of a germinoma. Um, and it'll, it'll look, uh, the, big, the big nuclei with prominent nucleoli help, might help you a little bit, too. So yolk sac tumors, the classic, the classic lesion in a, a, a structure histologically in a yolk sac tumor is called a Schiller-Duval body, where the tumor cells line up around a vessel. You're saying to me, like, that looks like a uh, perivasc perivascular orientation in a pendymoma, but it's not an ependymoma. It's not a glial tumor. It's, uh, it's a germ cell tumor. And this also will show uh, reticular formations where it forms like a net-like proliferation of tumor cells, all right? Looks like a net. All right. Teratomas. This is a little bit more straightforward, where you see lots of different tissue types added together. So there should not be normally squamous, squamous cells and then low cuboidal cells and then, uh, um, and then uh, cartilage sort of scattered willy-nilly throughout a, uh, a mass in the brain. That would indicate a teratoma. Peripheral nerve sheath tumors. So these are usually benign neoplasms derived from Schwann cells, the peripheral, the glia of the peripheral nervous system. Uh, they're, they may be GFAP positive then. They are often S100 protein positive. And classically, the difference between the two main types are schwannoma and neurofibroma. So schwannomas are 100% Schwann cells. So if you do an S100 stain, like the whole thing lights up. Whereas neurofibromas are a mix of cells. There's some Schwann cells, some mast cells, some plasma cells, and it has all this collagen in the background. And remember, schwannomas associated with NF2, neurofibromas associated with NF1. What do they look like under the microscope? So we see palisaded Schwann cells in a schwannoma, forming these things called varicate bodies. What is a varicate body? Basically two palisades of tumor cells. You see one here, and then one here, and then this anucleate area of fibrillarity in between it. So, uh, so the, the, the way I use to describe these things is, uh, is a little bit like, like 18th century warfare, where you had the gentlemanly people lining up along a field and shooting at one another, right? So here's your palisade of, of, of soldiers here, and another little palisade of soldiers there, and they're shooting at one another across the field, all right? So I think about a barricade body. Uh, I don't know why that came to me, but uh, in any event, that's maybe a reflection on pathology on my end. But uh, uh, then neurofibromas are a mixture of cell types with this shredded carrot collagen. Think about, you know, you're, you're shredding some carrots in the kitchen, and, uh, and they're falling into the, into, the, um, into the kitchen sink. This might be what they would look like. But what the, defines this tumor are these neoplastic Schwann cells wandering around within it. And they characteristically have some, uh, some mixoid background, and there will be a bunch of different tumor cell, uh, cell types going along with them, mast cells, plasma cells, so forth. All right, a few things for non-neoplastic pathology. How am I doing here? I've got a little bit of time left. So we're going to blast through some things. So reactive gliosis. So all sorts of things can elicit a reactive gliosis. 
uh, mast mass lesions could uh, post uh, you know post inflammatory lesions post uh, infarcts things like that but what do, how do we define this from an infiltrating glioma basically I think of the of, uh, of a reactive gliosis or a reactive astrocytosis as like throwing a net on the problem all right so the brain doesn't produce fibrous scars it takes glial, it makes glial scars. And when it makes a glial scar, it's like a net of, of astrocytes. And so the net is not that easy to see, but the nodes of the net are. And so a net is gonna have evenly spaced node, you know, little ties in between the different, uh, the different cords. So if you see, if you think of, the, there'll be evenly spaced astrocytes and the net will be in between them which would be re better, better shown by a GFAP, showing these evenly spaced astrocytes that are basically throwing a net to stabilize the problem, all right? So remember, pyloid gliosis is a variant of gliosis where you see lots and lots of Rosenthal fibers, and this is gonna be a trick for people because people will think about a pilocytic astrocytoma when they see that. Um, but this is classically surrounding craniopharyngiomas and hemangioblastomas. Uh, there'll be a lot of pyloid gliosis around them. Um, and it's important to remember that because a pathologist can easily be tricked because they'll be thinking like, oh, you know, we're in the cerebellum. Um, I see all this pyloid stuff. Uh, it's a pilocytic astrocytoma, but they don't see the hemangioblastoma. Um, necrosis or uh, uh, an infarct, all right? So this is a variant of an infarct called cortical laminar necrosis, basically where you see a line of, of, of infarct within the, the cortex. Um, but classically, uh, infarcts, uh, they have a couple of different characteristics. First things first, there's a bunch of macrophages in them. So remember, the brain undergoes liquefactive necrosis. So the brain parenchyma just falls apart, and macrophages come in and gobble it up. Um, and the, the only thing that retains the structure to that is a little bit of a reactive gliosis. But what you see um, in, a, in, a, in a, a remote infarct in the brain is typically just a hole. There may be a few macrophages left over and some glial cells kind of holding, holding up the rem remainder. Um, but uh, these, uh, these, are, these are the little macrophages here. This is a subacute infarct. And then there's these reactive astrocytes at the periphery. Um, and the other thing about an infarct is that usually there's subpeel sparing. So the brain tissue up here um, is fed a little bit by the CSF. Um, and so in, an, in a scenario of an infarct, the, the, uh, the, the gray matter underneath it will die, um, but the peel surface will, will hang on. Um, another macrophage-rich lesion uh, would be a demyelinating lesion. And the big difference here so here's all these macrophages again. So whenever we see macrophages and we're, and we're in neuropathology, that's a sort of a red flag for us to think about something that's not neoplastic. Because there's, on a frozen section, something like this looks hypercellular and it might be hard to see the macrophages. So you might think, oh my gosh, it's a glioma. Um, you, need, you need to be able to recognize the macrophages so that you don't call a demyelinating lesion a glioma. But uh, uh, if once you do recognize the macrophages, you're thinking, aha, macrophage-rich lesion. And in this instance, they're gobbling up this, uh, they're gobbling up the myelin. Um, but what is that, what is, what, what's the key difference with an infarct? Well, these axons are still intact here. Here's these axons running through this lesion. Whereas here, we did not have parenchyma in the background. It's just all dead. So a variant of a, of a, of a demyelinating lesion would be PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And in this instance, you would, of course, likely have a characteristic clinical pathologic scenario to have PML. Um, it may be mass forming, but the thing you look for are these characteristic viral inclusions. There will be weird looking astrocytes, what are called bizarre astrocytes. And then the oligodendrocytes will show this kind of glassy nuclear appearance that is the viral inclusion of JC virus. An abscess under the microscope, uh, basically, what's the, thing, what's the thing you'd see in an abscess anywhere? Pus. That's what pus looks like under the microscope. Lots and lots of neutrophils and lots of lots of debris. The edge of an abscess, though, will show granulation tissue. And here are the vessels of granulation tissue, and they will be oriented towards the pus. 
Um, and then there will be some, some inflammation around it. These are all these little neutrophils sprinkled into the wall. Uh, and then, of course, if you're hunting through uh, pus, sometimes you'll run into bacteria. This is fusobacteria in um, uh, cerebral abscess. Necrotizing encephalitis. So, I mean, an abscess is basically a, a localized area of necrotizing inflammation. When you have a generalized area of necrotizing inflammation, this is what it looks like. Um, oops, you'll have a... Uh, um, this, this background brain is becoming granular and falling apart. That's because it's necrotic. There's all these lymphos or neutrophils scattered through this tissue. Um, and it's not controlled. It's not one localized area. It's going all over. Um, and why would you see necrotizing encephalitis? This is a, uh, there's a characteristic differential diagnosis here. Fungus, uh, um, particularly for the brain, we see dematiaceous fungi like to go to the brain. Um, so that would include like Cladophyllophora. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Um, uh, another necrotizing encephalitis would be caused by viral things. CMV and HSV can both do it. Um, toxoplasma causes a necrotizing encephalitis. And then amoeba. And in this case, this is an amoebic encephalitis. Um, and so you look under the microscope and you find these amoeba. They look a little bit like, ma like macrophages. That's the thing that always tricks people. But the nucleus is a little bit smaller than a typical macrophage. And the thing that helps you, particularly in the, in the cases of acanthamoeba and balamuthia, is to show this little, um, this little cell wall. You'll see these cell walls, little crinkly things. That's allowed, that, so there's an amoeba. That is also an amoeba there. So they're not always easy to pick out. Toxo. Um, this would be the more common reason to have a necrotizing encephalitis. And so this is a bunch of toxi toxoplasma bradyzoites, a brady bunch. All right, that's the, that's the pseudocyst uh, of, of non-infective bradyzoites. So they basically proliferate within this pseudocyst, and then this ruptures, and the these little guys will then bust out and go infect surrounding cells as infective tachyzoites. Cytomegalovirus. This is a, uh, uh, a, a cytomegalovirus inclusion, the owl's eye inclusion of cytomegalovirus. Uh, this would, could also cause a necrotizing encephalitis, particularly in an immunocompromised individual. Granulomatous meningoencephalitis. It's characterized by granulomas. What do granulomas look like? They are um, clusters of epithelioid histiocytes with oftentimes central necrosis in, 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 in the scenario where you have a um, an infective, an infection-related granuloma, um, and then there will be a sort of rim of T cells at the periphery of these granulomas. And of course, when we see necrotizing granulomas, we think about AFB, uh, we think about fungus. Um, here's tuberculosis, classic medical school picture: little red snappers, right? AFB positive red snappers within uh, granulomas. If we look around for fungus, we might see. Um, uh, pigmented fungus, in this case that's what's called a dematiaceous mold, is a pigmented mold, and these guys have a lot of CNS tropism for some reason, um, and here's a, an example of one within um, a giant cell. Under, under a GMS stain, uh, that's of course a silver stain, highlights the fungus black, and so here's a GMS stain showing uh, fungal hyphal elements uh, within the brain tissue. Cryptococcus. Uh, by H and E, you see these little yeast forms. They're kind of variably sized, and there's a lot of space around them. They'll be in the meninges oftentimes, um, and that space is oftentimes is basically given by the fact that they have a characteristic mucin capsule that produces a lot of a lot of, of area in between the individual yeast forms. And you see that with a GMS stain highlighting the yeast forms, um, and then a mucic carmine stain highlights the mucin capsule. This pink is mucin positive. Neurocysticercosis. Basically, you're looking for something that is totally uh, uh, foreign to the human body. So this is some, not a structure that you find in the human body anywhere. You'll see lots of granulomatous inflammation. Uh, and then there's sort of a three-layered appearance to this. There's this, uh, this, this wall of the larva and then an inner area, and then, a, and then this, this, this little portion here, this pinkish area, um, is sort of a three-layered appearance to the larva. But the main thing is you're going to be looking for granulomatous inflammation, 
things that look like they are not from the human body, and oftentimes a characteristic clinic pathologic scenario. This one's tinea solium. Um, encephalitis, just generically, uh, what do you see in an encephalitis? You would see microglial nodules. So these are uh, collections of, uh, of, of uh, microglia, uh, or the resident macrophages of the CNS, along with some uh, lymphocytes. And oftentimes, these microglial nodules are aggregating around previously infected neurons. So this is a phenomenon called neuronophagia, where this previously infected neuron, it doesn't really show a viral cytopathic effect. Not all viruses do show a really characteristic viral cytopathic effect. But this is, is a likely infected neuron, likely due to the fact that it's got all these macrophages coming in to gobble it up. West Nile is just another example of, uh, of an encephalitis that produces a microglial nodule. Uh, this is, it, you know, you're asking yourself, well, he's just talking about granulomas, which are also collections of, of macrophages or histiocytic-derived things. What's the difference with the microglial nodule? Well, it's filled with microglia. That's one thing. And the other thing is, is that it's a little bit more loose than a granuloma is. A granuloma forms a distinct mass, whereas a microglial nodule is basically a collection of microglia on top of the CNA, of the brain parenchyma. HIV encephalitis, if you've got a patient who has an encephalitis and has giant cells, giant cells on a test, it's HIV. They love to ask about this. Uh, but it's an encephalitis with, with giant cells without the formation of granulomas. You'll just see these guys kind of sp sprinkled through a background of a more classic encephalitis. Rabies is ca classic, classically posse inflammatory. So you don't see a lot of microglia. You don't see a lot of microglial nodules. You don't see a lot of lymphocytes. The rabies passes in between the neurons from neuron to neuron. And what you do see are these little nagri bodies, the little pink eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions. Uh, Croissant Jakob disease. Um, this is something where you're going to be looking, of course, for spongiform change, these, this, this Swiss cheese appearance to the gray matter. Importantly, it's gray matter. If you see space, lots of spaces in both gray matter, there's gray matter there, it's got neurons, it's a little bit lighter staining than this white matter over here that has more defined processes within it and more myelin, so it's more pink. Um, and fewer neurons, okay? We don't see a lot of that uh, spongiform change over here, and, this, and that's, that's classic for CJD. If we saw it in both locations, you would think, oh, maybe this is just edema, because there would be more space in both, both spots. Focal cortical dysplasia. So this is, um, there's a bunch of different, there's a several different histologic types of, of focal cortical dysplasia. Remember, these are associated with, uh, with seizures. Um, it's a sort of a neuroanatomic malformative structure associated with seizures. Um, so these, it, and, and the classically, the things that are easiest to define histologically show abnormal neurons, all right? So you see these big, weird-looking neurons with, with pink cytoplasm and larger nuclei than usual, prominent nucleoli. They'll be a little clustered up, so they're disorganized. They don't form the, lice, the nice layers of the cortex. Um, and they look strange. And if, they're, if there's neurons with this very uh, voluminous pink cytoplasm, we call them balloon cell neurons, which is uh, def def definitional for uh, FCD type 2B. We made it. Thank you. <laughs>